taking pride in my recovery. Every addict knows that the rituals that go along with the addiction are often as powerful, as consuming, and as destructive as the addiction itself, the drug itself. An alcoholic who takes a drink, everything is important, the type of drink, the music that's playing in the background, the bar they drink it at, the food before and after, the company. And the same is true with the sex addict. And when times get tough, after a devastating loss or a really big win, it's time to reach for the top shelf. The best whiskey, the 30-year-old single malt from Scotland. Sex addiction has the same thing. Usually a few years younger than 30 years old, but you get the idea. It's April of 2013. Freddie and I have been dating for about a year. It's about three months after the story she mentioned in Vegas. I've been to one or two recovery meetings and I'm not in a good place. There's this thought that I can't get out of my head. If I get sober now, all of these things that I fantasized about, all these things that I wanted to do, I'm never going to be able to do it again. So let me get it out of the way, that just one more time. Just one more, just one more drink, just one more woman, just one more. Over those next few weeks, I cross boundaries and do things that I never imagined I would do. And I'm feeling bad, real miserable. So I reach for the top shelf. On my way to work, one morning, I stop in one of my favorite establishments. Yes, the morning. Ask for one of my favorite services. Me and two women. I'm thinking this is just gonna take me to bliss. Absolute serenity. It'll numb the pain inside me. I go in and I come out exactly the same, just as miserable. I drink and I'm not drunk. That feeling is panic inducing. It's the only way to say it. You really need a drink, really desperately need one. You go for the drink, not just any drink, but the best one you know of, and it doesn't work, it doesn't do the trick. I call the one person I knew in recovery. His name was Marvin. I said, Marvin, I need your help. Now asking for help I think is difficult for everyone, but for addicts it's notoriously difficult, and for this addict it's impossible. But I was terrified. Marvin asked me what I was willing to do to get sober. I said, anything. He said, you're serious about that? I said, absolutely. He said, that's the intensity and that's the focus that it's going to take in order to get sober. That's the case with any addiction. And this addiction possibly more so. It's a tough one to kick. I said, what do I need to do? He said, I need you to come to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Okay. He said, don't worry if you miss one. The next day you can go to two. <laughs> he said, another thing I need you to do is every single morning, Write down three things you're grateful for. Do that for 30 days, no repeats. Third, keep a pen and paper handy or on your smartphone. Write down all your fears. Just as they're coming up, repeat it as often as possible. Write it as many as you need, no limits. We'll talk about those as we meet. Fourth, every single day, speak to one person in program. That means you're gonna need a lot more numbers than just mine. And the fifth is we're going to start working the steps, the 12 steps. So how did I get here? How did a nice Jewish boy on Tishiva's whole life? How did I end up walking out of that place with those people talking to this guy about sex addiction? Let me take you back. I was born in 1985, a little area in Brooklyn, a Hasidic enclave, Crown Heights. From a very young age, I felt unsafe. Physically, it wasn't a safe place. Muggings, beatings, occasional rapes, murders. I heard about these things as a young child. The 1991 riots, Crown Heights, when I was six years old, made a tremendous impression on, on me. And when I, where I went, I was afraid. Psychologically and emotionally, 
also. 1985 in Brooklyn, low-income neighborhood, one of nine children. Those needs didn't even exist. They were pressing matters to deal with, not emotional needs. It wasn't even on anyone's radar. And admittedly, I was probably a little bit more sensitive than most, and I needed those needs tended to, but be that as it may, be that as it may, no one was paying attention to them. Things were in help when over a three year period, starting at the age of eight, I was repeatedly sexually abused by a childhood friend. Friend. I had a lot of worry and anxiety, although I didn't know that word yet. And fortunately, at a young age, I found masturbation. And I say that quite literally because one of the things I've learned in recovery is to appreciate my addiction for, my addiction for what it gave me. In, very, in many ways, an addiction is like amputating your leg when it's stuck under a rock to free the rest of your body. At the time, it's the most logical and sane thing to do. Over time, if you can figure out a way to remove that rock, that becomes the second most logical and sane thing to do. But at 12 years old, 11 years old, masturbation worked. What started out as masturbation to my fantasy or imagination eventually became masturbation to catalogs and magazines and eventually pornography and then eventually internet pornography where everything exploded. <coughs> Outside of a short, very, very traumatic period in my childhood, dial-up internet. Man, those pictures loading so effing slowly. <laughs> Trauma. The rule was always more. More variety, more frequency, and a more hardcore version. As my addiction to pornography progressed, so did this acceptance of it, that this is who I was. This was just going to be there. I made a, I would say every year on my birthday, I was gonna stop watching pornography, and every year on my birthday, I broke my promise. By the time I was 18 years old, I was in a yeshiva, rabbinical college, not far from here, in Snowden. <laughs> and there, the dormitory had a lot of oversight, and there was no laptops, or computers, or smartphones, or I don't think smartphones existed then, but there was none of these things. <coughs> but what I did find out is that not far from the dormitory, there was a strip club. And the day I found that out, it felt like there was a magnet inside me and a magnet inside that strip club. And, you know, they were on positive and negative. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And one day I found myself walking through that door and it was indeed bliss. Pixel turned, pixels turned into people. The stuff that I had been watching on the internet, now here it was. And for a few more dollars, I can get a little bit of human touch. Something that felt like intimacy closeness, and even love. As the years went on, and I found myself in different situations, strip clubs became massage parlors and prostitutes, and on and on, the rule was always more. More variety, more frequency, and a more hardcore version. So you can imagine why I was so terrified on that day in April of 2013, when I found out that what I thought was the top shelf I had grown a tolerance to. I didn't know if there was a shelf above the shelf. And even if there was a shelf above the shelf, possibly there is no shelf above a certain shelf. And I think this may be one of the reasons that addicts commit suicide is this realization, many addicts commit suicide, is this realization that there isn't this endless more more frequency, more variety, and a more hardcore version, eventually we can become tolerant to anything. And eventually we may not be able to numb that pain. Fortunately, the day I learned that, I had the number of someone, I had the number of Marvin. And I think it's the reason why an organization like Chabad Lifeline and doing things like this, public promotion is so important. So that the day an addict feels that, or the day an addict family knows that that feeling is coming on, there's a phone number to call and maybe get some of those directions. That seed can be planted in an addict's mind that there isn't only one way out of the hell. So kudos and respect to Chabad Lifeline for doing this and for doing this publicly. It's 
It's a big deal. After that phone call, I leaned in. I leaned in like a real addict. <laughs> you know, I've done 90 days and 90 days in strip clubs. I could do 90 days and 90 days in meetings. I listened to what Marvin said. I followed directions. And it was amazing to be able to come to a place, a group of people where I can share. I can, these secrets that I thought I would go to the grave with. Here I can talk to people about it and people that have been in much worse places than me and found a way out of it, they were sharing with me. And I learned about the toxic nature of secrets and the importance of at least one person knowing everything about me. I think now I've gone to everyone knowing everything about me. But <laughs> it's a different story for a different time. And this presented problems, like the time I was by a friend for dinner, a bunch of young guys and girls, single, and after dinner they say, hey, we're going out to a nightclub. What was I going to say? No, I'm a sex addict in recovery. Oh, okay, me too, I'm going. But that wasn't a place for me to be. The alcohol, the women, the music, the environment. I was extremely triggered as soon as I walked in the door. Eventually, I excused myself and I told this host that I can't be here, I gotta go home. And fortunately, I had a phone number of someone to call. I called someone in the program. I was able to calm that down, reduce some of that magnetic pull that becomes so powerful. I hated that guy, the host of the party. Man, oh, it's jealousy, hatred, all of it. The fact that he can just do that. Friday evening, party all night, and Monday morning, he's at work. No problem. My wife said that it was in between meetings in Vegas that I went to strip clubs. That was the first day. The second day, there were no meetings. There were just strip clubs. So I knew that I needed a different way. Several months after this experience, I walked into a meeting, and every meeting is a little bit different. This meeting was particularly heavy, particularly somber. And one after the next person shared just how difficult the recovery process was. I had just slipped, I almost slipped. My anger is coming out, these feelings that I never knew I had. As I go to the gym, you find out muscles you didn't have, you go to recovery, you find out feelings you never had. <laughs> these, um, and it's like one after the next, it's just beating themselves up, and I'm sitting there and the tension is kind of growing with each year. So I finally raised my hand and I just let out a laugh. And I said, it's kind of strange, you know, I've never sat around in a strip club all beating ourselves up, right? We pretend that everything was perfect. Here, things are, you know, pretty good in the sense that we're working on ourselves, we're doing good things, like, you know, the stuff people are talking about, anger, jealousy, loss, this is not something that only sex addicts suffer from, this is something that everyone suffers from. And here, people are being honest about everyday life experiences and working through it. So I'm not, you know, I'm not so into this beating the shit out of myself here today. As a matter of fact, I'm really proud I'm really proud to be a part of this group. I'm really proud to be one of you. And that seed of pride got planted inside me. And it grew. And it grew into a t-shirt that says, Porn Kills Love. <laughs> and it grew into four months ago. I did a talk on TEDx called Escaping Porn Addiction. Sharing my process, because I'm damn proud. I'm proud to be a recovering sex addict. And my wish is that more recovering sex addicts would do the same. Because what is a sex addict? A sex addict is someone who's looked for a lot of love and a lot of sex. And a recovering sex addict is someone who found out that sex without love and sex without intimacy is meaningless and soul crushing. And who can't benefit from that message? Are we the only ones with sexual problems? We all have sexual problems. I've looked for a lot of love in a lot of sex, and other people have looked for a little love and a little sex. But the truth of the matter is, with the way things are progressing, I think that a lot of sex addicts should take this message seriously. You know, this group said I had to jump through at 13, 14 years old to watch pornography. Whether it was finding the owner of a bodega to sell me a porn magazine, someone underage, or signing onto a computer in a living room of either my, my own home or home of a friend and look at some pornography. Those were major hoops to jump through. Today, 13, 14 year old kids have to jump through hoops not to watch pornography. 
Many so-called dating sites today, they're nothing more than what used to be in the underground of sex addiction, hookup apps, where two sex addicts can go to have sex just for that. And today it's become a little bit more commonplace. And I think that that message that a lot of sex addicts have learned, that sex without love and sex without intimacy is soul crushing, is an important message for a lot of the world to know. And we've acted out in secrecy and in the shadows for a bunch of years, and perhaps our healing can be a little bit more so in the light, similar to what we're seeing here tonight. I like to say that an addict is dry clean only. Right? You can take a cotton shirt, you throw it in the laundry, it comes out, the trunk a little bit, lost a little bit of its color and size, you can really notice. Throw some velvet in the washing machine and see what happens. Addicts are dry clean only. You gotta handle it with care, you gotta take care of it. Every day, 7 p.m., make sure you have a meeting. <laughs> but maybe the velvet and the silk also doesn't go well in the washing machine. Have a little message to share with the cotton t-shirts. The washing machine is not good for you either. It's not good for anyone. Sex without love and sex without intimacy is soul crushing. A sex addict is not synonymous with a sex offender. We've got Lamar Odom here. Lamar Odom had all the fame and all the wealth anyone can want, all the women. You're gonna hear his story. Where did he end up? In a brothel in Vegas, paying for sex. Why? He was looking for a lot of love and a lot of sex. It's not the creepy crawlies, it's not the people who can't get girls, it's not what it's about. It's people who have a lot of shame and who won't stop searching for love. And now I found a different way. I found it through recovery. And I found it through doing this, through sharing my message, sharing my story, and hoping someone else can be touched in the same way I was. Remember that jackass, the guy who can party on Friday night and show up on Monday morning? Guess what? Two or three years later, I swear to God, he walked into one of the meetings. <laughs> yeah. I asked him how he found out about it. He said he'd gone to therapy, he couldn't figure out what was going on, it was one day turned into two, and two turned into five, and when he looked, he's like, man, I have three dates set up on one day, I got a problem. He walked into a therapist, and the therapist said, you may want to go to a meeting. You might be a sex addict, go check it out. And I just wonder if that time in his house, I just had a little bit more pride about where I was, a little bit more pride of my recovery. If I had the pride, Chabad Lifeline, do an event here in a beautiful building in Montreal. Invite everyone they know, come to an evening on sex addiction awareness. If I had that, I could notify him. I could probably help him. A couple dollars in the therapy and a couple years of help. Thanks so much for letting me share.